Good morning, everyone. Good morning to those who are online as well. Um, I'm Grant, the youth pastor here at Hillsborough B. Pastor Jeremy, if you haven't heard, um, is on quarantine at home for the next couple of Sundays. So today, rather than him standing right here, he will actually be up on the screen with a pre-recorded message. Um, so we'll get to that here in a little bit. Um, and then next Sunday, we're going to do, Lord willing, we're going to do another Youth Sunday. Um, so I'll be bringing the message, and we'll have some youth up here leading worship and other things. Um, again, Lord willing at this point. Um, I just want to say real quick, too, for myself personally, um, yeah, my wife had surgery about three and a half weeks ago, um, pretty major surgery. And we've just had a lot of people be really gracious to us and bringing meals and, and reaching out to us. So just, just really thankful for that. Um, during times like this, it's just, it's just really good to be back home in Hillsboro um, compared to running around like we were for a few years. So just really grateful for that. Um, Garvey, if you want to go ahead and come up wherever Garvey's at, we're going to introduce a few um, new members of our congregation this morning. Good morning. Uh, I'm Garvey Schmidt, as Grant said, and uh, my wife and I have a privilege of serving as deacon caregiver coordinators along with a, a super team that we really appreciate working with. And one of the opportunities that we have is as people move toward membership is that we have an opportunity to join with them in hearing their story. And that's always a delightful time of encouragement and simply learning uh, about their pilgrimage and then uh, uh, inviting them to uh, be introduced to the local congregation. And this morning we have three couples that will be introduced to you, but before they come, I'd just like to make a comment or two about church membership, and that is we believe that it's important for us to offer uh, membership to baptized believers and to give them an opportunity to join in a local church, say like HMB, as part of the universal church, to be able to be encouraged, to be able to be prayed for, to be able to utilize their gifts, and kind of while they're in the area to officially say, yes, we are with you, and we are wanting to be a part of what God is doing. And at the same time, we as a local church commit ourselves to walk with them, to support them, and to encourage them, and to help them in the overall discipleship process. And I may just mention, if any of you are interested in in that, we would love to talk with you, either the staff or myself, and uh, we can uh, visit more about that. I may mention that as individuals move toward membership, they're invited to take a connection class. That's an opportunity for them to learn about HMB and to uh, learn about our distinctives, learn about our uh, uh, values, our beliefs, and uh, the mission that we as a church are on. And then they are given that opportunity to share with the deacons and then be introduced to you as a congregation. I'd like for the three couples that are joining this morning, or have joined, I should say, and we're simply wel welcoming them and uh, introducing them to you this morning to come forward and join me here on the floor. And uh, we'll kind of be, I want to use that word appropriately, spaced out uh, here uh, in the <laughs> service here. So we have Tracy and Adara uh, Holladier, and uh, they've been associating with us for uh, several months or maybe a little over a year as they've uh, sought to uh, identify the church that they want to connect with. We have Roger and Sandy Megley, and we have Ed and Leslie Miles uh, on, the, on the end over there. And I just want to say to each of you, we're excited about how God has led each of you here to HMB. Uh, with your gifts and your abilities to just uh, join HMB's story with your story. And uh, uh, we, we just are, are looking forward to how God will use you and has used you in various different ways. In fact, we'll be hearing from uh, Dara in just a little bit about some ministry that she's involved with, so we're excited about that. And uh, I just want to say also, as a local church, we commit ourselves to walk with them and to pray for you and uh, to be a part of your lives in various ways. So if you haven't gotten acquainted with them, uh, please do so, and you'll find, that, find them to be uh, delightful people uh, to, to know and to uh, enjoy. And I may mention, as we met with you several uh, at, at different times here to hear your story, one of the things I sensed uh, each of you saying in various ways was the fact that uh, you felt welcomed, you felt accepted, uh, you felt a warm reception when you came into the church. In fact, one couple said, when we entered, we thought we were home. 
And, and that's a good statement. That reflects what each of you and those of you who are online are a part of when you meet new people coming into the life of the church, uh, that we exemplify that spirit and, and that's uh, significant. So uh, I just want to say again how much we appreciate uh, you and uh, we affirm you. And I'd invite all of us simply to stand uh, in support of, of them. And I also then want to offer a word of prayer. But let's just uh, uh, give them a round of applause for uh, their involvement and what God is doing in their life. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for an opportunity to um, just welcome uh, people who have identified here with the local church and have identified themselves as members, and we just stand in, in support of them, and we also commit ourselves to continue to uh, be a welcoming church, to continue to be on mission, and we thank you for how you bring people to us, and we give opportunities to officially uh, link in with the local church, and may you just continue Continue to help all of us to make a difference in the world that we uh, have been called to, and may you receive the honor and the glory for this. We ask this in your name. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you so much. Thank you, Garvey. And then Dara is going to go ahead and share um, a pretty cool missions opportunity that we have um, to hop into as a church. So go ahead, Dara. Hi, I am Dara Halladier. I'm the executive director of Abiding Truth Ministry. Our website's abidingtruthministry.com. And we are really excited to get to um, partner with Mission Eurasia. Um, I've written several books, Bible studies and life management skill books for Christians. And um, we also carry some other books from other authors. And we've got a table out in the foyer you're welcome to come look at. And I'm going to be telling you about some of the books. So far, we've collected about $1,400. We're needing $5,000. And they're turning one of our books into a translation and editing it into Russia, Russian. And it will go out to 14 countries, including Israel and Ukraine and Azure. Beijan, is that how you say that? <laughs> All those ones that we don't know how to say over there. And um, we're really excited about this. There, this will be publishing a thousand books. We have given uh, Mission Eurasia the intellectual property rights to the Russian copies. And so they will also have digital ones available. So each of the thousand books will be used to train leaders and how to teach those books. And then they will go out and use that one book with the digital ones as well and teach and train. So those thousand books could reach hundreds and thousands of people. So we're really excited about that. So today, 100% of the profits from the books that I've written will go to the Russian project. 50% of the other, my other authors will go to the Russian project because I have to pay them for the books. <laughs> so um, this is Michael Cherenkov with Mission Eurasia, and we are partnering with them to do this. They've already started translating. If you want to go on to the next slide. That is our um, Wonderful Wisdom, which is chapter 11 in our high school book. So um, we have a original book was 80 Lessons Through the Book of Proverbs focused on life management skills. Um, homeschool high schoolers can get high school credit in life management, but it's really across the board for anybody. We've had high school, college, young adults, and even um, adults using that book. And then we have another one that's for our fourth to eighth graders, and they're wanting to translate that one next. And it has crossword puzzles and word finds, but very much geared to that fourth to eighth grade. And even though they're based in Proverbs, we bring in the whole counsel of God's word. So they're really a great discipleship program. The sixth lesson in our older student book that's being translated is the gospel, um, hopefully bringing people to the cross. We've also written Practical Proverbs for Women, Living Beautifully and Living Gracefully. There are 40 lessons. That sounds like a lot. Eight weeks, um, if you do five a week. I'm actually teaching it right now, and we cover about two a week, <laughs> um, based on, again, in life management skills for women. So the blue one, Living Beautifully, is Proverbs 1 through 9, and the other one is Proverbs 10 through 31. And then As They Sit and Stand is a little book that we wrote. Um, it's a resource and a guide for teaching your child the Bible. We broke it down by age groups and gave creative ideas for teaching Bible story, Bible memory, prayer, family devotions, biblical discipline, and service to your children. And the appendix is full of biblical worldview resources broken down by um, age. 
The mission of Abiding Truth Ministry is mentoring, teaching, and training the younger generations in biblical living. And so that's why we have some of these resources. I also speak at women's retreats and conferences, homeschool conventions, and things like that. And I do a lot of one-on-one -on -one mentoring. Okay, I think there's one more. This little book, Wisdom, Work, and Wealth, is 12 lessons. It's great for about fifth grade and up. And we talk about contentment. We talk about generosity. We talk about how do you set up a budget. And so it, it has to do with work ethic. And they are lessons from our older student book. And we beefed up the discussion questions. So those are the ones that I've written. I've got a couple others I want to tell you about that will be back at our table. Dr. Paul Barkey is up in Manhattan, Kansas. And he has written, On This Day in American History, we have one in Kansas history, one for church history, and one that's missionaries, martyrs, and ministries. And he took each day of the year, found something that happened on that day, wrote the story and wove in a biblical principle and turned it into 365 devotions for the coming year. So those are all four back there, and those are amazing. His research is just phenomenal. If you have children, biblically handling technology and social media, we do cover this a little in our younger student book, that fourth to eighth grade book, but this is a great little resource. We have a young lady from New York who has written two books. When she was in her late teens, early 20s, she was struggling with an eating disorder. She wrote the book, The Insatiable Quest for Beauty, and she shares very openly from her diary. She has the girls go online and look at um, interviews between her and her mom and her and her pastor about realizing that our identity is in Christ, not in the way we look and the way we act and perform. Then, when she was in her mid-twenties, she thought she would never get married. She wrote, Boy Crazy and How I Ended Up Single and Mostly Sane. And it's a novel, and it was coming to contentment in Christ. And then lastly, I'm going to run out of room up here. We have this wonderful book written by two professors um, at a university, Christian University in Oklahoma. It's Faces of Truth. It's 100 people, Christians, who influenced America. And he did these beautiful portraits with colored pencils, which blows my mind. I'm not very good at drawing. And then she wrote their Christian testimony, so their, their testimony, not just their biography. It starts with King Alfred the Great, the first Christian king of England, and goes chronologically to Tom Landry, the Cowboys coach. <laughs> so you'll find Del Rogers and um, Gutenberg, Pocahontas, a lot of history. And so those are back there. And again, and there's also a donation bucket. And so every, everything that we sell today, 100% of my products and 50% of these other authors will go towards our Russian project. On our website, there is also a donation button. You can always um, go and donate there. The prices for our Practical Proverbs are higher on my website because we do sell them for high school credit. And so if you want the price that we have back here today, you can always call the ministry and get the, web, the phone number off our website and just tell me you're from HMB and we'll go ahead and give you the uh, price we have back here. So thank you all so much. Awesome. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Dara. Yeah, it's pretty, pretty cool and unique opportunity, so be sure to check that out. Um, last couple of things I've got. Um, MCC has um, meat canning coming up on Thursday, November 19, and Saturday, November 21. So this is an opportunity to feed those who are hungry, um, especially during the times when right now, um, very important. So it'll be in North Newton, and our church is being asked for seven volunteers for three or four hours on those days. Um, lots of these will go to people that are directly affected by COVID um, and other, other situations. So the work is not difficult. Uh, many of the jobs allow you to actually sit if you need to. Um, so on that November 19, that Thursday, they need volunteers from 3 to 6 p.m. And then on Saturday from 9.30 to 1.30 p.m., 9.30 a.m. to 1.30 p.m. Um, there's a sign-up sheet at the welcome table out in the foyer. And if you have questions, please talk to Hank, Weeby, or Rod Ham. And they are taking extra measures to try and keep people safe. Um, during that, that serving time. Um, last couple of things before I, I pray. I mean, obviously, what a week it was, right? Crazy election with counting votes and everything, COVID spike here in Marion County. Um, I was just reading this morning, there's more wildfires that are actually coming now into western Kansas. There's, there's just a lot going on, right? Clearly, there's, there's many things going on, even if they're not directly impacting us here in Hillsboro. Um, so I just want to encourage all of us just to be gracious to people. Um, Right now, I believe we have a greater opportunity to love people around us more so probably than ever before, um, especially in Hillsboro. 
Um, so one verse that comes to mind, um, 2 Corinthians 5.14, says Christ's love compels us because he died for all. Um, so when you think about that, there's only one Savior. It's not either person that you voted for this week, anyone else on your ballot. Um, it's not anything else going on in the world. There's one Savior, and that's Jesus Christ. He is the Messiah. Um, so if we spend more time right now caring for others, um, write someone an encouraging note or a letter, or drop a, a meal off at someone's door, rather than being concerned of, oh, this person's quarantined. Where'd they get traced from? Oh, who'd this person vote for? They're wrong. Guys, that's, I mean, I just, I feel so convicted of that personally, um, just with where our mind and our thoughts and our actions go. So if we are being moved by the love of Christ, we will look different than the world, um, which is a really, really big potential impact right now. Um, So yeah, let's just, let's go ahead and pray for our offering and for the rest this morning. Uh, Lord, just, yeah, just the, uh, the busyness, the, the heaviness of many different things going on this week. Um, Lord, we, we trust that everything's in your hands. Um, every situation that we come across individually and collectively, um, you have foreseen it. You have uh, been in the midst of it, even when we don't see that, Lord. Um, and just, yeah, pray for, pray for our, our local community um, with, yeah, just as there's, there's situations going on with um, people needing to stay at home and be away from from work or areas or loved ones or school or whatever it is, Lord. Um, draw these people close to you. Um, may they know greater of who you are um, than the inconveniences or health problems or whatever that may be going on in their lives, Lord. May they be, uh, may be, they be gazing upon your face uh, more so now than ever, Lord. Um, pray to you just for, just for all the the people that are affected um, by, yeah, by wildfires and different situations, the hurricane that's, that's been ramping up. Um, Lord, just, yeah, there's, there's just, there's a lot going on. And so may we come to you where your, your yoke is easy and your burden is light. Uh, may we not trust in our own power and control when really we have hardly any of that anyways, Lord. Uh, may we come before you and sit before your feet, um, sit before your throne. And bless our offering that we take um, digitally, virtually, however, this morning, Lord, um, with, yeah, with MCC, with other uh, ways that we're involved with Mission Eurasia, Lord, there's, there's plenty of ways to be involved um, that we can, we can give of our time and our finances, Lord. Um, so may we, may we do that willingly. May we step into these things, um, not looking at what we miss out on ourselves, what we have to give up, um, but how we can love others well and in your name. Uh, we love you, Lord, and give the rest this morning to you. Amen.
Hi, and uh, well, we're back to me preaching to an empty crowd, uh, and that's unusual. I wasn't hoping to go back here all that soon, but I am in quarantine, and uh, I'm glad at least to be able to do this. Uh, but I'm going to pretend like I can actually see you and you're there. Uh, so, you know, like Robert, I love the tie this morning. Great way to step it up. Um, but yeah, announcement um, that I want to share is we've been uh, doing the shoe boxes and we've been collecting a lot of stuff. And this morning, some of you before the service uh, did some of the packing of the 200. And after the service, we need more people to pack the 200 boxes uh, of stuff that's been gathered and collected so far. But we still have 200 more boxes that we need to pack individually. So we need families to grab some boxes. And it's a really cool thing because this box right here represents one child that is going to hear the gospel. You're guaranteed if you pack this box and you bring it back, this child who gets this box is going to hear the gospel and may come to know Christ because of this gift. Because this brings them to the location where somebody is going to share uh, the good news of Jesus Christ with them. And you may be changing someone's eternal destiny for just about 25 bucks. That's awesome. What an investment. And so uh, take, take one, take two, take as many as you can, uh, afford to, to fill, um, and let this be a great gift this Christmas season. Um, and these are due back November 22nd. Uh, and then if you aren't able to get here and do that, you still can pack. They have now this year a virtual packing. You can do that online at the Operation Christmas Child uh, website. And uh, you can go there and you can select your stuff and they will pack it. And you pay the $25 to pack it and choose which items you want in there. And it's a virtual packing. So that's another great way to do it if you're not able to get out of your house right now. encourage you to do that, and there's a way to sign on there and say you're doing it through our church too, and that will count towards our goal of 400. So uh, let's, let's do that. If you have any questions, talk to Brenda Corrier or, or Brenda Sechrist. They're helping organize all of this, and we're very thankful for, for them and what they're doing. Um, also, I wanted to mention the other day a couple girls from our church uh, Addie and Elena Winter came up to our door, and uh, this was before we were in quarantine, and um, they said that they had heard on Caleb about someone, uh, a child, um, raising money and giving it to their church, and so they made bracelets and keychains, and they went around the neighborhood selling them to give money to the church, and then they uh, presented uh, for the offering uh, money here. I thought that was just a wonderful way of caring about church, understanding the mission of the church and, and what tithing does and what it means uh, that it's important when you give to the church. It's going out to change lives in our community and around the world. And for, for two young girls to understand that concept and to act on it was such an incredible testimony. It was so great. Proud of those girls. Um, all right, we're going to continue on in our series of Luke. We are in Luke 22, starting in verse 28. We're in the middle of the upper room. And today we're going to go into the, uh, from the upper room to the Garden of Gethsemane, uh, to the, the courts. And, um, and that'll be our text today. We're looking at tw chapter 22, verses 28 through 62. Let's, uh, let's pray as we go into that. Father God, we thank you that you're with us, whether we're at home or in person. We thank you for the church, and we pray that uh, you would speak to us this morning, speak through your word, and your Holy Spirit who is within us, may he communicate with our spirit and, and teach us what we need to hear today. And may we go away different uh, than we came. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, all right. Luke 22, starting at verse 
28. You remember last week we had ended with the disciples arguing over who is the greatest among them. And Jesus talked about the greatest one is the one who serves. And then he goes right into this. He says, you are those who have stood by me in my trials. And I confer on you a kingdom just as my father conferred on me so that you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom and sit on thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. So he got on them for, you know, for being selfish and power hungry. But then he, he, uh, he strengthens them here. He, he's proud of them. They have stood by him through, through these three years. And they've been loyal. So he, he commends them for that. And he lets them know in this that their ultimate destiny is to rule. And, and, and these 12 apostles, uh, minus Judas, who will be, get replaced later in Acts, but uh, the 12 apostles are going to rule over this as they're going to judge. That we, and the word judging there just means ruling. Uh, they are going to rule over the 12 tribes of Israel. When will this be? Probably the millennium, the thousand-year reign of Christ on earth uh, that takes place after the rapture, but before the battle of Armageddon uh, and before the new heaven and the new earth are created. And this will be the time when the prophecies of Israel that have not yet been fulfilled will be fulfilled. Uh, Israel will be, will be restored, but the apostles will be ruling over the 12 tribes uh, of Israel during that time. Now, the disciples are hearing this, and they're, what are they thinking? They're not necessarily thinking about the millennial reign. They're thinking now, the present. They still got in their mindset, in their mind, that, that Jesus is coming to overthrow the Romans and establish his kingdom now. And they're looking forward to that. And they're with Jesus. We're, we're going to stand by you to this, uh, to this end. But um, we're going to see here that they're going to come to understand that that's not the mission. The disciples have been strong. They've been following Jesus, but they've, they've been on the wrong mission. They haven't fully understood. They haven't fully grasped what it is that Jesus is trying to do. And as we go on the story, we'll understand more of that. But point one, and you don't have this in your outline. You just have to write this in. It's been a tough week uh, in quarantine, so I didn't get all the, the notes out in time uh, for the bulletin. But the first point is that we can't succeed if we're on the wrong mission. We can't succeed if we're on the wrong mission. We've got to make sure that we're, we're, we're fighting for the right cause and we're doing the right thing. And uh, it doesn't matter how, how, you know, how fast you run, how well you run. If you're on the wrong road, it's no good. Uh, you know, it reminds me of uh, when, when I was uh, in Alaska, there were I think 11 of us that were backpacking in Alaska, and we were in the wilderness uh, for 10 days. And um, with one of the trips, we were, uh, we were hiking through the tundra, and there was this, this big hill, and we had to get over this hill to our next place that we had to, to be. Um, and so we're, we're going up, the, uh, up this hill, and it was just the, the weirdest hill because... We would, we would start going. We, we think that's the top. You can see the, the top of the hill right there. And so we're going to get there. And then it's not the top hill. It just keeps going. The, 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 the crest just never came. We just kept getting farther and like, oh, my goodness, that, that, here's, the, here's the end. We'll be over it now. No, it's, there's still more hill. Uh, it was the weirdest thing. And so my twin brother, Josh, he decided, you know what, uh, this, is, this is crazy. So I'm just going to set my head down and I'm going to walk as fast as I can. Didn't care about anybody else. He's going to walk as fast as he can. He's going to get to the top. He's not going to look until he knows uh, he's over uh, the other side. So he starts booking it, and he's huffing, and he's working really hard. Did a great job of hiking. Got over the hill, but when he turns around, nobody else is there. And he is lost in the wilderness of Alaska. And now he's got to try and find, uh, without a map, 
where we're supposed to meet and gather. So we're looking for him. He's looking for us. Now he's alone. And so, you know, he's clapping, singing hymns uh, out so no bears uh, will attack him, trying to be as loud as he can. Scary time. He was walking great. He was hiking really well. He, he didn't care about who was around him. That sounds like all good stuff that we Christians ought to be doing. We ought to be, you know, marching for Jesus. We ought to be uh, working hard. We ought to not care what the world thinks of us. But if we're on the wrong mission, we're fighting for the wrong cause, it's all in vain. And we're going to be lost. We're not going to uh, succeed. There's people that are fighting, you know, political wars and things like that. And just, you're on, you might be on the wrong mission right now. You might be fighting so hard for this cause and you're really turning away a lot of people because you're not showing the love of Christ. Or, or you're fighting for love and you're saying, you know, all it is is that love matters, you know, and, and, and all it is is love. And then you neglect truth and the truth of, of God's word. And, and so that now, now there's no sin, there's no judgment. And then the cross doesn't even make any sense. And you come up with a false gospel. We can fight really hard for a cause, but be fighting for the wrong thing and be wasting our time. So we can't succeed if we're on the wrong mission. The disciples were on the wrong mission. They thought they were establishing a kingdom now. And that's not what it was about. So he goes on. And he turns and he, and he says, Simon, Simon, in verse 31. And I think at this point, uh, this is probably a little private aside conversation for, with Simon. It says, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan has demanded permission to sift you like wheat. But I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail and that you, when once you have turned, again, strengthen your brothers. But he said to him, Lord, with you I'm ready to go uh, both to prison and to death. And he said, I say to you, Peter, the rooster will not crow today until you've denied me three times that you know me. Okay, it's interesting here. Um, Jesus uses the word, the name Simon. Like early on, in the ministry, Jesus said, you know, your, your, your name's Simon, but I'm going to call you Peter, Petra, the rock. You've been called Simon, but, but this is your name. You're the rock. But here, now at the end of Jesus' ministry, he says, Simon, Simon. Why does he do that? You know, we don't know for sure, but I think that uh, what he's doing is he's alluding to the fact that Peter isn't going to be the rock right now. He's going to be acting more like Simon. But he will be the rock. He, he continues on to, to call him Peter after this. Uh, but he's not the rock yet. He's not the rock yet. He's Simon. He's got to go through a period uh, of sifting. What Jesus says, Satan is asked to sift you like wheat. But after the sifting period, that's when you're going to become the rock. The sifting period is very important. What is sifting? Kids, you might not know what the word sifting is. Uh, sifting is when they separate the wheat from the chaff. The chaff is all the stuff that grows with the wheat that you don't want, you know, so that it won't make bread. It's just the extras, and you don't want to have that. Well, the wheat is heavier than the chaff, and so what they would do is they would put, uh, when, they've, when they've gathered up all the wheat and chaff together, because you can't separate them yet, you put it onto a blanket, and you would, a couple people would take the corners of the blanket, they'd throw it up in the air, and the, the wheat and the chaff would float up in the air, and then the wind would blow, and the light stuff, the chaff, 
would blow away and the wheat would fall down because it was heavier. And so they would keep doing that and the chaff goes away and the wheat comes down. And it's separating the chaff and the wheat. The chaff you don't want, the wheat you do. And Satan is, and I, and I saw this happen actually, they, they still do it a lot of times uh, in villages in, in Moldova. And one time I was on a missions trip, I saw them out there sifting the wheat. It's really cool to see that. Uh, but that's what Satan is asking of God. He's, he wants permission to sift Peter and the disciples because he uses the word you all. Satan says, Simon, Simon, Satan has asked you all. Uh, to, to sift you all. It's the, the, the plural in the Greek, like wheat. So he's not just talking about Peter here, but he's asked to sift all of them. Basically saying, hey, I want to I wanna tempt them in such a way that they will fall away and you will see that they're not your true disciples. They're not true followers of you. It's kind of like uh, with Job, when Satan asked permission from God, you know, Satan had roamed the earth, and God says, hey, have you considered my servant Job? Have you looked at Job? Job's a righteous guy. He is a follower of me. And Satan says, yeah, it's because you give him everything he wants. The guy's got it good. Of course he's going to follow you. Let me test him. Let me take some of the stuff away, and, let, and then you'll see that he doesn't actually follow you. Same kind of thing is going on here. Uh, Satan is saying, I want to sift your disciples because they're not real followers of you. Satan doubted their intentions. David, Satan doubted their hearts. So let me sift them. And Jesus gave permission. And again, just like in Job, Satan can't sift us without God's permission. You cannot be tempted beyond more than you can bear. God knows what you can handle. God's got our back. Right? But, and so... Jesus gives permission to Satan to sift the disciples. And then he says, and it's in the singular, that's why I think he's talking specifically uh, to Peter, uh, probably quietly. He says, but I've been praying for you. Because he's, he's telling Peter his mission. I've been praying for you that once you turn back, you're going to fall away, he's saying. You're not going to make it. But you're going to turn back. And when you turn back, strengthen your brothers. We see here, you know, in this that Peter says, uh, or sorry, Jesus says um, that I've prayed for you. I'm allowing Satan to do this, but I'm praying for you. I'm your advocate. And this is a really a great thing to remember and point two that I, you know, about being sifted and being on mission. Point two is that we can find comfort knowing that Jesus is our advocate. We can find comfort knowing that Jesus is our advocate. Jesus is praying on our behalf. He doesn't leave us to go through the sifting alone. In our lives, we go through hard times and sometimes that is Satan sifting us. We wonder, why do bad things happen to good people? Sometimes we're being sifted. But we're not ever going through that alone. We can find comfort knowing that Jesus is our advocate. And Peter makes a great declaration here. He says, you know, I'm ready to go with you. I, you know, I'm not, I'm not going to fail you. I'm ready to go with you to the death if I have to. And... And Jesus says, yeah, I admire that, uh, you know, that heart there, but you're, you're going to fail. You're going to deny me three times. You're going to deny that you know me. You're going to say, I don't know you. I don't know Jesus. Three times before the rooster crows. And we're going to see why. A lot of people think that it's because Peter was afraid. I don't think that's the reason. All right, let's continue on in verse 35. After Jesus says this, then it says, Then Jesus asked them, When I sent you without purse, bag, or sandals, did you lack anything? Remember when he sent the 70 out and he sent the apostles out? Um, he says, Don't take a bag or a purse with you. you know, he says, Don't take anything with you. Because when I sent you out like this, did you ever lack anything? Nothing, they answered. He said to them, But now, if you have a purse, take it. And also a bag. And if you don't have a sword, sell your cloak and buy one. 
it is written, and he was numbered with the transgressors. And I tell you that this must be fulfilled in me. Yes, what is written about me is reaching its fulfillment. The di- disciple said, see, Lord, here, here are two swords. That's enough, he replied. This is a hard little passage right here to, to know. What is Jesus saying? Well, the, the, the main idea, Jesus given metaphors. And he's talking metaphorically here. Uh, he's not saying to go, go buy a bunch of swords because he didn't. They didn't. Right? Uh, he, but he's, he's talking metaphorically to say, look at, I've been with you, but I'm not going to be with you anymore. I took care of you, but for a short time here, I'm not going to be with you and you're going to be on your own. And he can't be talking about always because Jesus said when he came back after the resurrection and the Great Commission, Jesus said, lo, I am with you always. Make disciples of all the nations. Da, 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 da. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the earth. Uh, so um, he's not saying that forever, but there's going to be this period of time where I'm going to be taken away, where there's going to be people that are against you, actively against you, trying to hurt you. And what are you going to do? And I think he's speaking metaphorically here. You know, uh, he's not saying take up arms or all that, but he's speaking in such a way that reveals their heart. And this is what Jesus does all the time. He talks in a way that people can misunderstand him, depending on where their heart is. And now we're seeing their true motivation. They say, look, we got two swords. What are they saying? We're ready to fight with you. Where did they get these two swords? How long have they been having them? I don't know. Uh, Were they just sitting there? Uh, Were were they hiding them? You know, did Jesus know about these two swords? I don't know. He says, you know, go sell your stuff and and get swords. uh, We got these two. Uh, I I, I don't know. I I wish I could have been in that room for that conversation. But I said, we got these two swords. And Jesus says, that's enough. In the Greek, it's, it is enough, singular, it is enough. He's probably not saying two swords are enough. Like, hey, we're going to do this rebellion, and you got two swords, that'll do. He's cutting off the conversation. He says, that's enough. We're not, we're not talking about swords. I, 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 that's not what I, you're, you're missing the point. It's enough. Let's move on. We're going to the garden. Um, the disciples, though, they're thinking the rebellion is now. And they're probably thinking, okay, two swords. We got Jesus. And we're, we're willing to go against any size army. It doesn't matter how big they are because we got Jesus. This guy can do miracles and we haven't seen everything. We haven't seen the extent of what he can do. But if he can calm the wind and the waves, if he can heal blind people, if he can walk on water, if he can raise a man from the dead, he can take care of an army. The rebellion's happening. It's finally here. The kingdom's going to get established, and we are with you, Jesus, to the death. And they meant it. They're on the wrong mission. They meant well. They were fervent, but they were on the wrong mission. And it it goes on in verse 39. Jesus went out as usual to the Mount of Olives. So this was a normal thing that they did uh, while they were in Jerusalem during this period of time in Jerusalem. This is where they needed Judas to show the the, uh, religious leaders where they can find Jesus in private. Hey, we always go to the Mount of Olives. There's this garden there. And you can get them alone at that time. So Jesus went out as usual to the Mount of Olives, and his disciples followed him. On reaching the place, he said to them, Pray that you will not fall into temptation. He withdrew about a stone's throw beyond them, knelt down and prayed, Father, if you are willing, take this cup from me, yet not my will, but yours be done. And an angel from heaven appeared to him and strengthened him. Jesus said, it's not my mission. 
If I could have it my way, I'd do it a different way, but not my will. I'd, I'd love to have this cup taken from me. I'd love to do it a different way. I don't want to go to the death. Jesus was in anguish. But he says, it's not my mission, it's your mission. Not my will, but yours be done. And an angel came and strengthened him because he needed strength to go to the cross. That is not an easy thing that Jesus did for us. So then, and, and being in anguish, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat was like drops of blood falling to the ground. He, Jesus was sweating so profusely as he knew what he was going to do. This was not easy. And so Jesus is, is, is in anguish, thinking about the suffering that he's going to and what are the disciples doing, right? He goes over, and when he arose from prayer and he went back to the disciples, he found them asleep, exhausted from sorrow. He says, why are you sleeping? He asked them. These people who are going to be loyal to him to the end, they can't even stay awake with him. The other gospels talk about, you know, more, more prayers and more of these times coming. Luke doesn't mention all of that. But we know that Jesus, you know, he's kind of hurt that these disciples aren't, aren't with him. They can't even stay awake. How are they going to protect him? Not that he needs protection, not that he wants protection, but it's showing their loyalty. He found them asleep and exhausted from sorrow. He says, why are you sleeping? He asked them, get up and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. What did Jesus really care about? He wanted them to, to be praying so they did not fall into temptation. Satan is out to get you. He's asked permission, I told you, to sift you like a lion, I mean, to sift you like uh, wheat, and you're sleeping. You're supposed to be praying. You need to be praying if you're going to overcome the enemy. And here we see the importance of prayer. Jesus needed it for strength for him to stay on a mission. The disciples needed it to not fall into temptation, to succeed through the sifting, but they ignored it. And, and, and point three, we cannot succeed without prayer. We cannot succeed without prayer. If you're going through difficult times, you don't know why you're going through those difficult times, but it might be, as I said, that Satan is sifting you, and he's growing, and, and God's using that to grow you. Like with Peter. But you can't succeed. No matter what it is, no matter what the reason is that you're suffering, you need to be going to God in prayer, not turning away from Him. John 15, 4 through 5, another passage from, from the Gospels of the upper room. Uh, Jesus teaching in the upper room before, be, before He goes to His death. He says, Remain in me, abide in me, and I will remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine. You're the branches. If a man remains in me and I in him, he will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Do we believe that? Do we believe that apart from Jesus, we can do nothing? That we, that we desperately need him, that we need to be attached to the vine? To bear fruit and that it, we can't do anything without him. That we will not succeed in life. Succeed based on success, his success, not our success. His mission, not our mission. But we're not going to succeed unless we are attached to the vine. How much time do you spend in prayer? How much time do you spend in God's word? Or are you like the disciples sleeping through this life? See, now I, you know, I don't really need that. Sleep's more important. What, what, what takes priority in this life over prayer and being attached to the vine? 
The disciples didn't get it. Jesus warned him. He told them that Satan is going to sift you. And they sleep. Jesus was giving them the model in the garden. This is what you need to be doing. I need strength. I need to be in prayer. And if Jesus needs that, how much more do we? He goes on in verse 47. It says, while he was still speaking. So as he's talking to the disciples, get up, you guys. You need to be praying. You're going to... You're going to fall into temptation if you're not praying, if you're not abiding in him. So his grace is in you. He says, while he was still speaking, a crowd came up. We're supposed to be alone here. Now there's a crowd. And the man who was called Judas, one of the twelve was leading them. He approached Jesus to kiss him. But Jesus asked him, Judas, are you betraying me? Are you betraying the Son of Man with a kiss? When Jesus' followers saw what was going to happen, they said, Lord, should we strike with our swords? Is it now? Is it, is it the time? And before Jesus could even answer them, it says, and one of them struck the servant of the high priest, cutting off his right ear. But Jesus answered, no more of this. And he touched the man's ear and healed him. Then Jesus said to the chief priests, the officers of the temple guard, and the elders who had come for him, am I, am I leading a rebellion that you've come with swords and clubs? Every day I was with you in the temple courts, and you did not lay a hand on me. But this is your hour when darkness reigns. Jesus was showing them, exposing their hearts, that they cared more about what the people thought. Jesus isn't leading a rebellion. And Jesus made it very clear, I'm not leading a rebellion. Even though his disciples thought that's what the mission was. So now we've got Peter who stands up for Jesus. He's bold, he's courageous, he's doing what he said. To the death, I will go with you to prison or to death. He gets the sword out and he hacks off the guy's ear. Now either he's a really good shot, he just wanted to, you know fire a warning shot and uh, take off the ear, or he just wasn't really a good swordsman. Probably the latter. He was a fisherman. So he was probably trying to kill the guy, but he, he got his ear, fortunately, because that wasn't the mission. And Jesus says, stop this. This is not what we're doing. It's the first time that, wait a second. I thought that's what we're doing. This is the time. And Jesus takes the guy's ear and he heals him. And he surrenders. He throws up this white flag. He gives himself up. His disciples abandon him. They desert him. Why? This is not what we signed up for. Wait, I thought we were doing, I thought, I thought, this is the battle. This is, we're, we're starting, starting the rebellion now. The kingdom's here. We're with you, Jesus. And Jesus doesn't go along with the mission. Because that wasn't the mission. This is the big aha moment for the disciples. So they, they leave, and then it leads to, the, to Peter's disowning Jesus. In verse 54, it says, Then seizing him, they led him away and took him into the house of the high priest. Peter followed at a distance. And when uh, some there had kindled a fire in the middle of the courtyard, had sat down together. So there's these people that are outside the courtyard. They can see Jesus with the religious leaders. They're off at a distance. So they got this fire going, and Peter sat down with them. And a servant girl saw him seated there in the firelight, seeing, seeing the glow on his face. And he, she looked closely at him and said, This man, this man was with him. But he denied it. Woman, I don't know him. He said, a little later, someone else saw him and said, 
you're one of them. Like they remembered him. They, they, they've been walking around town with him. Man, I am not, Peter replied. About an hour later, another asserted, certainly this fellow was with him, for he is a Galilean. They've been trying to figure this out. Yeah, yeah, this guy, he, I can hear the, the Galilean dialect. He's, yeah, he sounds like a Galilean. Certainly, he's one of them. He's not one of us uh, Judeans at down here. And Peter replied, man, I don't know what you're talking about. And just as he was speaking, the rooster crowed. The Lord turned. Remember, because they can still see Jesus on trial over there. So the Lord turned and looked straight at Peter. And then Peter remembered the word the Lord had spoken to him. Before the rooster crows today, you will disown me three times. And he went out and wept bitterly. I don't think Peter denied Jesus simply because he was afraid. A lot of times people attribute cowardice to Peter, and it's, it goes so much deeper than that. When did we ever see Peter being afraid, being a coward? Peter's the one that got out of the boat and walked on water because Jesus said he could. That's not a coward. Peter said, I'll go with you to the death. Peter's the one that gets out the sword and hacks first. That's no coward. So something else going on here is there's more than just fear going on. Peter, I believe, felt betrayed. He thought this was the mission, was rebellion. He's with Jesus on that mission, and then Jesus says, no, that's, that's not what we're doing. And Peter says, wait a second. Now he's like lost. Jesus, Jesus just, just gave himself up. So he's not going to lead us against this army. Well, who's going to protect us now? Which is exactly what Jesus was telling them metaphorically before about taking the purse, taking the swords. You know, you're going to be on your own for a little bit because I'm giving myself up because this is the mission. Me surrendering. Me being a lamb led to slaughter. Me becoming that Passover lamb that I've been talking about in the meal. Me covering your sins. Me go taking death, your death, and putting it on my shoulders. Me taking your place. That's the mission. They didn't get it. Peter was sifted. The disciples were sifted. They left him. They abandoned him. They denied him. But it's not the end of the story. It's not the end of the, uh, Peter's story. Jesus said it. You know, you're going to come back. You're going to turn back. And after that, strengthen your brothers. He's going to be restored. You might be going through rough times, as I said. Perhaps Satan is sifting you. Don't turn away from God now. Now is the time to turn to him. Listen to him. Make sure you're on mission, his mission. And if you fail, it's not too late. Peter failed. God loves you. God will pick you up, take you along. He'll restore you. Maybe you've already failed. It's not too late. There's forgiveness. It's like going through a dense forest. Imagine going through a dense, dense forest where there's, there's no light. This, this forest of confusion. When you're going through hard times, it's confusing. Why is God let, allowing this? Why am I going through this? Where is God? Am I ever going to come out? 
ahead. Is there ever light at the end of this tunnel? We mix the metaphors. We're going through this dark forest of confusion. And finally, as you keep going and going, eventually you get through and you come to the outside and you see the bright sunlight. You see the beauty outside that forest. And you experience God and his kingdom like never before. If you go through this sifting, if you go through these difficult difficult times, and as James says, consider it pure joy, my brother, whenever you counter various trials, God's going to use them. No matter what the reason is, whether it's Satan's bringing them and sifting you, or whether God's bringing them, doesn't matter. If it's just, co- just, you know, the way the world is, you're going through hard times, doesn't matter what the reason is, God will use the trials to grow you, to strengthen you, so we can consider it pure joy. And we turn to Him We get down on our knees, we pray, we read God's word, we get grounded, we abide in him, and we will come through, and we will know God. We will be closer to him than we've ever been before, and that's what God wants for you. He wants to take you from this faith to this faith, from grace to grace. He wants to grow you and to make you more and more like him in his image. That you can bear his image so that the world doesn't see you, but they see him in you and are drawn to him. Let's pray. Lord God, you create us in our image, but we've been marred and scarred by sin. It's so often we just bear our own image. So often we try and lead people to us, and we're not leading people to you. Help us to be people who glorify you. May they see you in us. Lord, we thank you for trials. We thank you for difficult periods in our life. We don't like them. It's painful during the time. It's confusing during the time. But Lord, we consider it joy because you will use it. You will grow us. Help us to turn to you and never to turn away from you. We ask this. In Jesus' name, amen. If you don't have a relationship with Jesus, I invite you to put your trust in him. It's never too late to do that, and there's never a better time than the present. Uh, feel free to, to email me since I'm not here. Uh, I'd love to talk to you. I can, or give me a call if you have my number. Or email me. I'll give you my number. We'll, we'll talk um, if you're interested in, in what that means to give your life to Christ or, or, or find uh, one of the pastors or somebody you know here um, and, and tell them you, you want to know what it means to become a follower of Jesus. Let's uh, continue worshiping in song. This morning added another element of technology to our services. It's just another example of, of coping with the, the COVID pandemic. What many of you don't know is that just before the prelude starts this, each morning, there's a, a flurry of activity back in the booth as we get ready to do Facebook Live, and we have to open up Open Broadcaster System in order for Facebook Live to grab hold of our videos and put that out for you to happen. And then Brenna gets on, or I get on, and we get it onto the website, and all those things happen. In the midst of all of that, uh, Facebook sometimes goes down, Sometimes the open broadcaster system just doesn't work like this morning. So those of you who are, who are watching online had no sound. So we have to shut the system down, start it up again, go back through all the steps again. So it's real exciting. Um, sometimes Internet, of course, goes down. And I cannot believe that we haven't had a power outage. The famous Hillsborough power outage is in the middle of all these things that are, that are going on. So there's a number of things that we've had to learn, and we've learned a lot through the struggles that we've gone through. By the way, the video, thank Daniel Moss for his editing this morning. Uh, I tell students as an educator that a child in a difficulty is simply an opportunity to learn something new. And when things get really bad, I say, boy, look at all the new things we're going to get to learn how to do. And that's what what life is, and that's the challenge that Jeremy gave us this morning. The music that we're singing this morning, the text invites you to take the challenge and to commit yourself to that that growth. And so, again, pay attention to the text. I invite you to buy into that text and then to keep that as we move forward. Would you stand as we sing together? (laughs) 
for the cause of Christ the King. We give our lives and offering till all the earth resounds with ceaseless praise to the Son. cross and follow the sun. Let it be my life's refrain to live as Christ, to die as King. Deny myself, take up my cross and follow the sun. Christ, we
pray. Now, Heavenly Father, in your great love, you've given us your Son to pay the penalty for our sin by dying on the cross and to show us the way back to relationship with you. I ask that you would just, that each of us would allow you to search us, to look into our lives, to see where we have areas of growth, where we have areas of commitment. By your spirit, empower us and enable us to live the lives that you have called us to live. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above the heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. missed.